right, let's see. Let this come up. All right, how's everybody doing? Hotep, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African, African History Network show. It is Sunday, August 18th, 2019. We are live. I'm here with uh, Michi X and uh, Jade Arendelle. We're going to talk some about the Black Agenda Tour uh, Brooklyn, coming to Brooklyn the weekend of August 24th, 2019, and talk about some other things and what the Black Agenda Tour is. So how you doing tonight, Michi? I'm good. How you doing? All right. All right. Good. So there's no echo. So that's good. Uh, and Jade Arendelle, how, how are you doing? I am blessed. All right. All right, good. So you've seen uh, a lot of people familiar with Michi X. People have seen uh, Jade Arendelle as well. Everybody watching, share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also, okay? I'm going to give you some uh, valuable information. All right, so a lot of people have been hearing about the uh, Black Agenda Tour, uh, Michi X. We know it started out in Detroit. Uh, it went to uh, Chicago. It went to uh, Atlanta. So let people know who may not be familiar, what exactly is the Black Agenda Tour? Well, the Black Agenda Tour is the movement in this country to create agenda for our people, right? It's by our people, for our people. And so what we're doing is first, we are going from city to city, as I like to say, hood to hood. And um, what we're doing is making sure that our people across this nation really have an understanding of how it is that we are attacked and oppressed in this country. So we break it down in five areas and those five areas cover the gamut of it all. And then we give solutions so that you can start with them in your own life. Um, also solutions that lead out into the community. We are also building a unified front across this nation with black organizations in every community that we go to. Um, and we also present those organizations as a solution to the community. So it is it is something that has uh, several phases, but we're in the first phase. And basically, I like to call this phase the unified part. And so we are doing that. We're touching down in all of these communities, seeing faces, meeting the people. And we are unifying not only the people, but the organizations. And we're going to do that across this nation. Once that's done, then we'll talk about what's next. OK. OK. So um, now, Jay, uh, how are you involved in uh, the Black Agenda on tour? Absolutely. So I am, you know, as a resident of Brooklyn, New York, I'm going to be talking about, you know, several issues that are happening uh, within the Black community um, in New York in terms of anti-Black violence that's taking place with, you know, certain merchants, um, the profiling of Black children and other Black men and women, um, and just, you know, us. Um, and being at the receiving end of anti-Black violence and how to organize around that proactively on all levels, how to organize, you know, on the grassroots level with community members, how to form alliances with certain elected officials, um, how to form alliances with, with people and, and Black news media um, to get our messages and our narratives out and to actively fight against racism and white supremacy as it is uh, being projected onto the Black community here in Brooklyn, New York. So I'll talk about some things that have worked for me in terms of my advocacy, the work that I've done here, what I've learned, uh, being, getting, you know, being involved in the political process, forming alliances with certain elected officials, um, and getting some results, and really using what I've been doing and what the brothers and sisters on the ground here in Brooklyn have been doing, and in New York City in general have been doing, um, and how to kind of like mold that into a model that can be replicated across the United States of America, where we are, um, you know, victims, uh, so to speak, of racism and white supremacy, but also trying to shift that narrative of victimhood into one of empowerment and, and being proactive and fighting back um, and being very, very solution oriented. All right. And uh, I will be speaking about uh, six principles of political self-defense, doing a presentation on that, understanding how public policies impact the economic conditions of African-Americans, understanding how to leverage our uh, uh, political power, uh, leverage our vote to push an agenda as well. All right, so uh, Michi X is coming to Brooklyn, New York. So give us the details, what's going on in Brooklyn, when and where? Okay, so let me give you the address. The event is Saturday, um, and it is from 10 to 4. The doors do open at 9, and um, it will be at the Makata Museum. What's the date? Uh, it's um, Saturday the 24th. Okay, Saturday, August 24th, 2019, everybody. Yes, and that address is um, 80 Hanson Place. 
and it is the Makata Museum. It is a black owned museum. So we're excited. We do all of these events in black owned venues. Um, if it ain't black, then it ain't happening up in there. <laughs> and then before Saturday though, for the big event, um, where of course we will have you and Jade and a host of other speakers, we will also be talking about defense of ourselves, our communities, um, and how to prepare for those type of things um, and actually enact them and get busy doing it. So there's a whole lot that's gonna be offered. There's gonna be some entertainment. We're gonna have the black market where we're gonna spend money with black vendors. But Friday before that, proceeds which is the training and that's going to be at sister's place it's um 456 nordstrom ave and um you can get all that information on the website at the black agenda on tour.com but the training is basically a free training it's for organizations within the community who um can come and that's where we actually talk about the um the part that the organizations play because their part is different from the individuals in the community we right. talk about the national database what that looks like and where our plans are in the future after we unite and so that is what that training is for and that is um free to all people who are part of an organization that is for black people and they're right. doing for black people. <laughs> this okay, is a so, alignment as well. Right. You, what, what was the last thing you said, Michi? This is a no ally event as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So um what so so far there there been, I think, and oh oh you also did Colorado, uh Denver, Colorado. Denver. Mm -hmm. So so far, what has been the response of people who come to uh, uh the black agenda on tour? Um, it has been a really great response. It has been very um, wonderful and, and humbling for me, um, but we've got nothing but great reviews. There are people who have left with this information. I get a lot of emails every day from people who have taken the information that they have received and they want me to know that they're starting homeschooling. They're doing certain things that we have told them that they can do. Um, they've taken the knowledge and they're implementing it. So it is actually changing the lives of our people, you know, um, you know, small groups at a time, but you got to start somewhere. But for the people who have showed up, we, we have not had any complaints yet. And um, we have had a lot of reviews of people who have taken the information and implemented it in their lives. So for me, it, it's been a great success because it's actually making some change. It's not about just talking. Uh, we can see the effects right. of it actually working in our people's lives. So I'm excited about that. Okay. Okay. Excellent. All right. So we're going to be in uh, Brooklyn the weekend of August 24th. Um, it, you know, when people talk about an agenda, I've studied some of some of the agendas. Um, that African Americans have had in the past that have been presented by different uh, groups, uh, different civil rights groups, et cetera. But um, during this political, during this um, 2020 political campaign, uh, presidential political campaign, we hear a lot about a black agenda. Mm -hmm. And as I explain to people and have been explaining to people, a black agenda is not something that we wait on elected officials or those seeking political office to present to us. A black okay. agenda is what we present to them. And, and, and it gives us a uh, measuring stick. It gives us some criteria to uh, measure the elected officials to see if they're, see how their policies match up with our issues, our needs, yeah. our agenda, okay? And it also gives us a roadmap to follow, especially after the election is over with. Because after the election is over with, that is the end of one phase and the beginning of another phase of holding them accountable and still being able to push your issues and get these things written in the law, push the policies, et cetera. So um, what, how, how do you all, how do we focus on that? What, what, what do you explain to people? How do you get people to uh, understand this? Because, and the reason why I say that is because oftentimes, you know, previous elections, people just, you know, they go for this candidate because they got a catchphrase. They go for this candidate, they have a viral video. This candidate, you know, uh, you know, they, they, they want to date them or whatever it is, right? It's something superficial, okay? How, how do you explain this to people? Well, what I would say in that is that I think that's the, the biggest thing that we bring to the table about the Black agenda. You know, I get a lot of people who off the rip when they hear the name, they say, oh, well, this is a political movement. No, actually, it's not. Everything that right. we do talk about comes back to politics, which is something sure. that you break down right. for everybody, Michael. We appreciate you. You bring a big part to the tour that we need. Um, but a lot of people don't even understand how politics works. But I would tell right. you this. Our people cannot move forward when it comes to political action. First, they have to be knowledgeable in how that right. works. We right. have to be unified in how that works. And as you have said, we have to have an agenda that we're saying to the politicians, this is what our agenda is. Now, right. if you want our vote and we understand how voting works, we understand how politicians work, we use that unification across this nation and that understanding. And then we have the people to back the things that we wanna push. And I don't think that we've ever taken that approach. As you said, we just, you know, we go in and we, 
and check a blue box and then we check all the other blue boxes and we don't even know who half of them are because we don't understand politics and how they work for us. So I just want to convey that as, as a people, we need to first come together, have an understanding and a knowledge of how to get what we want and then we have to enact it. But first we have to get that understanding and then we have to unify. If there's no, no unification of the people with an understanding, then how do you back any political action that you want? You need the people and you need the understanding of how it works. Right. And, and, Absolutely. Even though, and, and, and even though I'll come to you just a second, Jay, mm -hmm. even though we talk about even though we talk about politics, it does not mean we're saying you don't need an economic empowerment component. That, 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 right. that, that, that's not what we're saying. But you have to have a synthesis of the African history and culture that gives you your values, your interests and your principles, your VIPs. You it, This influences your economic empowerment and your political empowerment. You have to have a synthesis of all three of them. OK. All right. So, uh, Jay, go ahead. What were you about to say? Well, I was going to say, instead of like this being conceptualized as a political movement or merely, merely a political movement, it's a code of conduct. It's definitely a lifestyle, right? And so that lifestyle is for us to um, be walking, breathing, living, doing agents, agents of Black power in it, everywhere we go. That's going to advocate for self-determination, um, self-defense, the survival, you know, and continuity of our kind. Um, and also we're advocating for resources and tangibles, right? Tangible right. resources for the black community. And so we're, we need to really focus. I think um, we are focusing on the outcomes and what we wish to create and bring to the community um, and our generations to come as opposed to just getting caught up in the weeds of the political process only, right? And so there's, it's the, the, the black agenda is multifaceted. There's a financial component, there's a health and wellness component. Um, there's a, you know, a, a cultural awareness, knowledge of self component, so forth and so on. And so we need to really start to look at the black agenda from a holistic standpoint. Um, and the same thing with reparations as well. I want to I want to plug this because like yeah, mm -hmm. like we, we definitely do need tangibles. Um, we definitely I'm I'm advocating for us getting a check cut, you know, eventually um, for reparations. But we want total repair and the financial aspect of creating and us getting reparations is only one aspect of that, right? We need spiritual right. healing, we need mental, emotional healing, and all of these different things. And I, you know, what we're offering is for um, folks in our community in the different cities that we are going to with the Black agenda to look at our movement, um, this code of conduct, this lifestyle as something that's holistic and multifaceted as opposed to just one dimensional or two dimensional. Right, right. When we when we deal with reparations and uh... I've talked. I talked about that today. I, the, the African World Festival is going on in Detroit. Not only am I a vendor, I'm doing presentations at the museum, uh, inside the museum, uh, classroom 106, 5:30 p.m. Uh, on Sunday. Uh, so when we deal with reparations, first we need to understand history and law. And unfortunately, many of our people don't understand history and law. But you have a lot of white people don't understand history and law either. Um, but reparations deals with repairing the damage. And it, it, so it, we can't look at it as, as like a red, black, and green megalotto. So it's dealing with repairing the damage, not just from slavery, but the legacy of slavery. So economic compensation can be part of an overall package, just as yeah. economic compensation was part of the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866. It was also land compensation. Okay, so there's a number of different things. Um, okay, so uh, Michi, you... Uh, uh, Talk, well, well, well very, very briefly, Michi, let people know, how did you come up with this concept of the Black agenda, uh, of the Black agenda on tour? How did you come up with this concept? Because I, I don't think you've mentioned that yet. Um, well, for me, just like a lot of Black America, I was really tired of watching our people be murdered in the streets every day, protests not working. You know, we go out there, we write some words, and we think that's going to get us free. We tear up the streets, they say go home, and nothing's changed. And then we hashtag their names, and we get ready for another cycle um, mm -hmm. because it's coming again. You know, it never fails us. And at the same time, I was dealing with personal issues in my own life. Um, 20 years ago, my brother was murdered in prison by the guards. He was hung. They called it suicide. And... Um, it wasn't suicide. There was a whole lot to it to show that they had murdered him. And so when Sandra Bland got killed, it was a really, you know, sore spot for me. Um, I've always uh, mourned for Tamir Rice to this very day. If I talk about the boy, it'll hurt me. My son has been caught up in the school to prison pipeline. And when that happened, it really opened my eyes to understand what it was. I was studying it at the time in school. Um, and then my son got caught up in it. 
and um, to recognize what it was because I didn't have that understanding even in my early 30s and I'm just 40 I didn't have that understanding of exactly how we were attacked I mean I knew it was racism I understood some things and then what really happened is I fell into a really deep depression for about two years and um, I secluded myself in my room I turned off my TV because I didn't want to watch these shootings anymore and I um thank God, the help of my mother. And uh, basically I, I did a lot of research and I looked at things like the Black Panther Party. I looked at the things that we've done in this country, the civil rights movements. And I looked at what worked and I looked at what didn't work. And, um, you know, I, I wrote a lot of these things down. And in my research, I came out with the Black Agenda when I decided to come out that room. Um, my thing was is that I, I couldn't continue living like these things weren't going on and I refused to not do something about it. And so I decided to turn my pain into some power. And um, that's exactly what I did. So this was birthed out of my pain and um, that pain caused me to want to do something about it. So like I said, in researching what we got right, what we got wrong, I took the pieces that I thought would work. And so um, this is how we have the black agenda. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. You, you know, you talked about police shootings. Yes. And I, you know, I've done a, a presentation dealing with the history of the war on drugs, and it goes back to Richard Nixon's war on drugs. He declared June 17, 1971. This is long before the 94 crime bill. This is before Ronald Reagan's war on drugs, 1982. This is before the foundation to the school to prison pipeline was uh, laid 1986. That's what it, that's where we see the school to prison pipeline really starting 1986 with the, uh, the bill that passed Congress dealing with uh, drug abuse enforcement or something, I forgot exactly how they, the name of it, but that's what put police officers in the schools that we now call school resource officers. That goes back- I to, call them corrections officers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it goes back, that goes back to 86. But um, I, I was at, uh, at my vendor booth today, somebody who um, listens to my show came by mm -hmm. and we were talking and uh, I asked them, um, we were talking about the police killings, things like this. And I said that when you actually look at the statistics and I've looked at them, I look at them each year, there are more white people killed in this country each year by police than African-Americans. We're killed disproportionately, okay? Which means that a higher we make up a higher percentage of the killings than our 40% of the population. But the, 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 but the best database on this is probably from the Washington Post, it's called Fatal Force. Fatal Force, everybody should look at this. Fatal Force, they, they look at um, newspaper articles, they look at local news stories to put together this comprehensive database each year of police killings. They break it down by race, they break it down by whether the person was armed, unarmed, whether there was body cam footage, cell phone footage, whether the person had a knife, it's broken down, you can search, right? Each year, there are more white people killed by police than there are African-Americans. So if this is the case, where is the body cam footage of white people being killed by police? Why don't we see this on, why don't we see viral, viral videos of this? Why don't we see this on the news? Because they'll show this, you know, well, Alton Sterling with on, uh, I, I can't remember what it was, New York Daily News, New York Post, one of the big New, New York uh, newspapers, the daily newspapers, they had him on, they showed his body on the ground bleeding. They didn't even blur it out. But 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 usually when white people are killed by police, we don't see that, okay? So then we have to start asking the question, well, why is this? One of the reasons why I think this is, and we'll go to Jay in just a minute, is because as long as unjust police killings are looked at as just a black thing, you're not going to have change. See, when white people realize that they're being affected by it, just like the opioid crisis, if, if the opioid crisis was just hitting black America, you would not have you would not have laws being put in place. You would not have people talking about correcting it. When you when you look at um, the, the when you look at the civil rights movement, what pushed the Civil Rights Act of 1954, uh, 64 over the top and broke the filibuster that was taking place in the Senate was when Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney were killed, June 21st, 1964. See, when 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 white people, when, when they started being hurt, now even though they're Jewish, right? When they started being hurt, okay? Then when, if they, when it started affecting them, then you started seeing changes. When Viola Louisa, who was from Detroit, drove down, she saw, she saw Bloody Sunday, March 7th, 1965, in her living room on TV. She drives down to uh, Selma, to help the African-Americans uh, fight for the right to vote. She gets killed by the Ku Klux Klan. 
This is nationwide news, okay? So when we go through and look at certain things like this, right? As long as it looks like just black people are being touched by it, you don't see the massive need to change. But when when it when it's shown that white people are being affected by it, now you start seeing more concern and 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 and, and, and um, um, momentum to change the conditions. Um, Jay, go ahead, because I know you've been involved in a number of different um, incidences and in, you know, protests, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so this is what I think. I think, well, thank you for bringing up those examples and that website. I definitely want to check that data and that research. WashingtonPost.com. Washington. Washington Post. Yeah, and I want to I want to like go through that, that data um, that shows that white folks are actually um, killed more by police officers. I mean, and I guess... <laughs> Yeah, because they make year. up sixty-three percent that, of the population. That, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, but that's, that's because it's much that more of them. They're a larger. Yeah, that's sixty-three percent of the population. population. Um, we're killed at a higher rate, though. But yeah, that's I was, what I said. Yeah, I was just we're gonna, killed disproportionately, but we don't see. Absolutely, we, we don't see the videos of them being killed by police. So you have to well, ask the question why. I think I think that is because there's definitely an agenda on the part of of the mainstream news media, which is an anti-black agenda that you know gets off on showing images of black death, right? Um, even when, you know, black men and black women are assassinated, um, yeah, by police or not by police, for example, um, well, yeah, like we saw our ancestor, Malcolm X's body, his dead body, like that, that went viral, that was all in newspapers, right? So there's mm. something about dead black bodies being shown and that reinforcing images of you know or or this mindset notions of white supremacy and and mm -hmm. it's supposed to create um sentiments of black inferiority that's what i think so i think that clearly like why would the mainstream news media right that's set out to protect and create you know a, a white agenda um why would they show images of dead white people Right. Like the, the whole <laughs> the whole conspiracy, so to speak, is to create a black boogeyman and, you know, painting us as criminals, black men as rapists, X, Y and Z. Um, and those that are deserving of disproportionate punishments because we are seen as criminals, we are criminalized. So I think I mean, I definitely want to look at the data, but I think I mean, my obvious answer to that reason is that like there's some sort of it's like racist porn basically to to mm -hmm. show dead bodies of black men and black women and black children right. um on mainstream news media and that's not something that's going to be conducive to the fragile sensibilities of white folk which is why they're not going to put that out there on the mainstream mm -hmm. news news media um outlets um but i will also say that black men black women black children black elders are more likely to be disproportionately killed and executed by law enforcement because of unconscious racial bias and mm -hmm. on the part of law enforcement individuals, even if they are non-white, right? This stuff has seeped into the consciousness of America is woven into the fabric of, of the American culture that black men, women, and children, especially black men are criminals, deviants, et cetera. And so when someone feels that they are confronting a suspect or a criminal that happens to be black, they will be more likely to pull that trigger on them um, as opposed to if it were a white person. Right, right. I, I like to say all the time, I, I state that the police are the biggest um, terroristic gang in the United States of America. And their biggest target is black people. But that doesn't mean that they don't have other targets. So I agree with you that they kill everybody, right? Um, and they get away with it a whole lot. But when you find that they kill white people, they pay the penalty for those a little bit more than when they're doing it to black people. But I will say this, black people are used as two things in this country, as commodity, whether it's, you know, and whether it's you being a consumer and being conditioned about ridiculous shit, whether it's the prison industry, right? Um, and all of those things or we're used as disposal. And so when you show black people being disposed of and killed, it gives even ourselves, we don't understand that subconsciously, it's a big conditioning. It tells the rest of America, but it even tells ourselves that we're worth, we're worth less. People right. become very um, immune to watching black people die. We even do that ourselves. Like we'll cry a, a, a while, but how many police shootings does it take before we're not as enraged or our anger doesn't last as long? That happens to a lot of black people. And so what it does is it helps to desensitize us to the violence against Black people by allowing it to be shown. 
Um, when you don't show all of these white people being murdered, the reason that we mm -hmm. they do not do that in this country is because we don't want you mm -hmm. to see white people as disposal or that they can just be done away with that nobody cares about their lives in the streets. They want to keep that under wraps because they want you to think all these black people get killed in the street, you know, we can dispose of black people left and right. And I think that this is why you see the difference in the two when you always see black people being murdered but not white people because white people definitely get killed by the police too. So, you know, when we have these black shootings and all these white people want to come on these feeds talking about, well, they should have listened to the police. Well, 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 they're, they're so ignorant because as you said, white America is very conditioned too. And they're just as dumbfounded as everybody else um, by watching media and everything. They don't realize that there are plenty of their own kind being murdered in the same manner, but because they don't see it, they always want to run their mouths about why they want to justify the black shootings. It would be interesting to see what they would say if they watch white officers and black officers and Hispanic officers murder white kids and white people the same way. What would they say to It would be interesting. Right. Another dynamic. That's why America doesn't let it happen. Exactly. I must also uh, add so, really so, quickly. Just, just, just one second, right? Just one yeah. second. Uh, Washington Post fatal force uh, as of um, August 16th, 9.28 p.m., 570 people uh, have been shot and killed by police in 2019. Uh, we break it down by race. Uh, 191 were white, uh, 130 African-American, 112 Hispanic, 24 other, 113 unknown. We posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast. People need to... Uh, uh, research and study that that database from um washington post fatal force uh go ahead jay thank you just really quick i just really quickly wanted to add that um i also know that the projection of these images of of slain black bodies is also mm -hmm. supposed to i mean it is psychological warfare as someone in the chat uh, pointed out but it's also it's designed trauma. to Yes, trauma. It's, it's designed mm -hmm. to traumatize us. It's designed to make us feel like we have no agency. It is designed to completely disempower us and to, it's like lashes. You know, every time we see those images, it's like a, a backlash. It's like, you know, reminding you that like, you better fall in line, mm -hmm. you know, bend to the will of white supremacy, assimilate, conform, integrate, and all of those different things so that that will not happen to us. And if we step out of line, that's that's what that's what's waiting for us on the other side. And so I'm a part, I'm a glad to be a part of the Black Agenda Tour because it's we're going out and actively talking about Black empowerment, right? Creating Black empowerment on so many different levels and like letting us know that like we do have agency. There are things that we can do to protect ourselves. There are things that we can do to protect our children. There are things that we can do to change policy right and to create some safety for ourselves so i wanted to make sure i plug that all right uh okay excellent okay uh, uh michi x let people know how can they get tickets for uh, the black agenda on tour in brooklyn new york august uh 24th 2019 what do people need to do um, you can go to the Black Agenda on tour.com and you can purchase your tickets there. There will be tickets for sale at the door, but if you buy them online, you can use code Brooklyn and put it in at your checkout and it will take some money off of your ticket. Um, so those are the two ways that you can purchase tickets. I will also say this too. We do have several tickets to give away that have been sponsored by other people. So there are about five spots, first come, first serve. Um, you can email me at therealmichiex at gmail.com. And uh, let me know you're interested in those five free tickets and it's first come, first serve. Those have been sponsored by um, some people that wanted to purchase tickets that weren't able to make it, but they wanted to uh, purchase them for other people. So um, I'll throw that out there. So those are the three ways y'all can get some tickets. Okay. And then also if somebody, uh, if uh, someone watching right now wants to sponsor tickets for someone or they want to make a donation, what should they do? Um, they can also do that um, on the website at the Black Agenda on tour.com. There's also um, a link there that they can do a donation if they would like to do that. Um, and if they wanted to purchase a ticket, they can just donate it that same way. And in the um, in the um, notes of the donation, they can say that it's for a pay for ticket for somebody. OK, uh, let's see here. OK, excellent. Um, all right. Now you talk about the. Uh, five ways we're under attack. Okay, Michi. Um, go ahead and explain what you want to about that uh, to people so they can get a better understanding of uh, the Black Agenda on tour. 
Okay, well, we, we use an acronym called PEEPA um, just to represent that we peep game. We see what they're doing to us. Um, and so uh, that acronym stands for the five ways that we're under attack in this country. I like to say that if, if your body is damaged, your head is bleeding, your arm is falling off, and your foot is falling off, if you just fix my head, I still got an arm and a foot that's jacked up. So we have to deal with the problem as a whole versus just a piece of the problem. And so that's where the five um, areas that we're under attack come into play. And the um, acronym PEEPM stands for, um, the first P is for physical attack, um, the E is for economical um, attack, and then we have educational attack, we have political attack, and mental attack. And if you look at all five of these areas, they all encapsulate um, all the ways that we're under attack. Now, when we get into all of those, all of those have many levels. Um, and I won't go into all the details here. Of course, at the Black Agenda, we will. But for example, when we talk about the physical attack, we don't just talk about um, the police officers killing us. That's usually the number one thing that comes to people's mind when you say we're under physical attack. Well, we talk about us also being under physical attack that there are bodies that are literally being used as slaves on prisons that are really just the new plantation today. And we break down exactly how that is. I mean, these private prisons are literally on the stock market. So bodies are being sold every Monday morning when the stock market opens. Um, but we also talk about the chemical, the chemicals that damage our body. There has been research and studies done that states that all black hair products, 80% of them have chemo chemicals um, that cause cancer in them. And those um, products the are not even on the jars. So you don't even mm -hmm. know. Um, a lot of them are on all these natural hair products as well. We think it's just the perm, but it's it's in 80% of our hair products, but you don't find this in white people hair products and everybody else say, hey, ain't no cancer and no suave. You see what I'm saying? So these right. are the things that we don't, we don't pay attention to when we talk about the lead that is in the water. There are many schools, Baltimore is one, but in Detroit not too long ago, there was 103 schools, I believe that I read, that their water was shut off due to the fact that there was lead. So they were spending a quarter million dollars a, um, a month to pump in bottled water Water to all of these public schools, but our children are still washing their hands in that school. And if you don't have the knowledge and understand that your skin is the biggest organ, and while they're washing their hands in that bathroom, that lead is still going into their system. We don't find these problems in the white schools. So understand, even if it's the food that you eat in your communities, um, there's a different type of food that is pumped into our communities so that we're not eating the right foods, we're not eating healthy foods, and even the things that we think are have been um, um, been um, produced with um, hormones and more um, cancer causing chemicals in them. And it's a fact that we get different products in our communities and there's studies to show that than in other communities. So I could go mm -hmm. on, but that's just an example of one. It's too many to cover tonight, but at the agenda, we do that. So we go into detail of each one of how we're under attack. It's not just one way because we could even talk about vaccinations and how it's causing all kinds of problems for our kids and autism. And so there's a lot of ways that we're physically under attack and people just think of the police and it is so much deeper than that. In each one of these areas that we cover in the acronym people, we break down all of them and they all have many layers to them. It's not just one. Okay, excellent, excellent. So we'll deal with that. Uh, we do we do that um, each, uh, each time, each city. And then there's also a panel discussion with um, usually those who are doing uh, their different pieces, their different presentations. I'll be dealing with six principles of political self-defense, how uh, public policies and laws impact the economic condition of African-Americans. Uh, I'm gonna show you some examples of this and we have to understand uh, politics is the legal distribution of the scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. And oftentimes we just look at uh, politics as in voting, but we don't really understand policies and don't understand how policies impact every aspect of our life. Uh, a lot of people right now, uh, a lot of people don't know that they are uh, invested in privatized prisons uh, through their 401k plans or their pension fund plans. So they may be protesting privatized prisons, but your 401k plans and pension fund plans right. are invested in privatized prisons. Now, I'm not saying get rid of your 401k plan and pension plans. No, you need that, okay? But you can call your money, you can call your uh, benefits manager, okay, and find out what industries are you invested in, what companies are you invested in, okay? So one of the things I talk about is how oftentimes we unwittingly finance our own dehumanization. Yeah. And, 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 and we can fight back. We have to understand the concepts of redistributing the pain. As Dr. King uh, talked about uh, April 3rd, 1968 day before he was assassinated. And he, he was dealing with economic empowerment, things like this long before he was assassinated. He didn't just start talking about that the day before he was assassinated. When people say that, you're telling me you never read any books that Dr. King wrote. Yes, people, Dr. Yeah. King did write books also. He wrote five of them, 
okay? But uh, one of the things he talked about when he spoke to the uh, sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, he said, up until now, it seems like only the sanitation workers have been feeling the pain. He said, we have to kind of find a way to redistribute the pain. And he told them to go out and tell their friends and family to boycott Wonder Bread, Coca-Cola, uh, Hearts Bread, and still test milk there in Memphis for the discriminatory hiring practices. All right. And he's talking about economic economic withdrawal. He said he said um, we have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. We have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. And what he's saying is when we have mass protests, it can't just be mass protests. We have to have targeted, sustained economic withdrawal to put pressure on those who you are protesting against so that you can push your agenda. This is what he was explaining to us. All right. OK, so in uh, Jay, now you're there. You are there in the Brooklyn area and you're an activist and Lioness Crown and uh, uh, woman about town extraordinaire there in the Brooklyn area. Um, and then also, uh, I know you talked about it early, earlier on, but um, uh, just give us a brief synopsis of what you're going to be talking about there in uh, Brooklyn, August 24th. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about community organizing um, okay. and the different ways to advocate on a grassroots level um, all the way from yeah doing it in a community, responding to one issue and direct action and that can look like protest and that's only one level for a movement or to, to, to respond to a given issue but it needs to go from protest educational awareness all the way to policy change, right? And, and finding um, allies within the political system that can actually support the change of policies and implement those policies. And so I'll be talking about that. I'll be talking about um, different examples of, you know, movements that I've been a part of in Brooklyn, as well as, you know, some other, <laughs> other things that may happen, um, you know, other headlines we may see on the news in terms of hate crimes and like what we should right. be doing um, in response to hate crimes, how to bring awareness, um, be on guard, and also let other folks know about those things, how to defend ourselves against those things, how to recognize symbols and codes of white supremacy when they do show up. They may show up in schools, you know, among mm -hmm. a teaching staff, or they may, um, you know, could be your next door neighbor. Hey, we never know, but we need to know the, the signs and symptoms of, of white um, identity extremists, terrorists I like that, that we need to be aware of, <laughs> right? And, and how to how to protect ourselves against those and especially protect our children against those. So I'll be talking about that a lot. I want to okay. say too, I think that the Black Agenda, we have like a really dope team. Of course, Michael's on the team and he's really yes. smart and he gives you all, all that political and historical knowledge you need. So come with your pen and your paper because you need to take notes. He's going to tell you all the books, where to find it, probably what page it's on. Do not play with me. <laughs> know his shit um and then jade i want to say you know people never give themselves the credit that's deserved so i would like to give her some recognition for the fact that she's not just an activist in brooklyn she is actually an activist that has been involved with some very major events that have happened that a lot of people may know of if you guys remember the um the uh, Apple nail shop, I believe it was called right, right. in Brooklyn, and they jumped on the um, grandmother and uh, her her granddaughters because over the five dollar eyebrows. Well, um, Jade and her crew were the ones that were very effective in the fact that they shut that man down. They ran him out of town. His shop is gone. He is no longer there because you don't get to stay in our community abusing our women. Um, she was involved with the corner store Caroline situation. She was there dealing with the family when all of that took place. And I don't know if you guys have recently heard about the black guy who just got stabbed in Brooklyn by a white supremacist. He is not dead, but um, Jade was one of the first ones there on the scene and she has been in touch with him directly um, to see how yeah. he's doing. Oh, yeah, correction. So yeah, I've, I've been in direct contact with my folks who were there and responded. And so, and that's the thing too about these sorts of movements. Like we don't have to be everywhere at the same time, but we have to form alliances and have networks that we are our first responders within the community. And so I have to shout out the folks that, you know, our folks like actually witnessed that happening. They you know, actually went to the scene where the suspect was arrested um, and have been in touch with uh, the brother who has been hospitalized. And so I'll have some updates on that as well. I wasn't able to directly see him um, as, as was the plan yesterday, but you know, I definitely had my ears and eyes open on the ground 
Michi, so thank you so much for, you know, shouting out. I just, um, yeah, I just want everybody to know that because that's part of what she's bringing. You know, we talk about solutions and the reason that she is on the team, um, you know, everybody that's on the team has been picked for a reason. And the reason that she is doing this is because she's actually done the work. So when people say, how do we deal with these entities in our community and get uh get some results? She's done that. So she's going to explain to y'all how y'all can do the same thing, right? Um, And get involved in those actions in the community. And that's why she is very necessary. Also, I did want to give a shout out to um, somebody else that will be joining us. He's not here, um, but Q Butter from Zion Institute will be joining us. And he has a school in Harlem. He is a brother who got up just like the rest of us, decided to make some change. He had a studio and he decided to teach math and science to children and teach them more about their blackness and who they are. And he started off with about six students. He is now at 70 and um, he just took what he had and he's making a difference. And so it doesn't take millions of dollars to start a school. He started with what he had. So he is going to be talking exactly how we can continue to build those things in our community. What he has is what I would classify when I speak about solutions as a community school. That's what I call a community school it is funded by the community and his own pockets and the people out there so people can't tell me that we're not our answer people can't tell me that we can't make a difference because there are people doing it every day and that's the big part of the black agenda we're finding these people that are doing it and we're giving them a bigger platform and we're giving them the help that they need and giving them an opportunity to get this knowledge to other people because they're not just talking about the work they are doing the work and that is important to be represented at the black agenda we we done talking now we're going to do some talking because you can't get to the solutions without the knowledge of how right. we got where we were first yeah, but after that, yeah. we gotta we, we gotta we gotta implement some action with that and so that's what this this tour is about exactly okay so it'll be michi x uh jace johnson jade arendelle michael m hotep uh hashem uh, uh um hashem uh, yeah. as well uh young activists i think who will be with us also uh so it, it, people come on out now what will be the next cities after brooklyn uh michi um october 12th would be uh, we have a little bit of a break um after this one and then october 12th would be oakland and then after that we have dc which is don't quote me on this you can find out at the site at the black agenda on tour.com but uh, two weeks after um um, Oakland, then we're in DC. And then um, two weeks after that, the first week in um, November, we will be in Houston. And that will be our last city um, on the tour for this year. But um, next year, it don't stop. Like, this is not just a, a momentary thing. We're going to keep moving until we get free. This is not a conference. This is more so what I would like to call a movement. And so right. we're going to continue to move across this nation and we're going to hit all the hoods before it's done. So we're going to take a little break. We're going to come together. We're going to, um, you know, regroup and we're going to talk about the cities next year. I will tell you some of the cities next year that will be coming. We already know St. Louis is on there. New Orleans is on there. Memphis, Tennessee is on there. Florida is on there. So um, we do have some cities already down that we will be coming to next year. Um, and then um, about February, we will release the new cities and um, the places that we will be in 2020. Okay. Now, um, uh, uh, give people for August 24th in Brooklyn, give people the uh, name of the venue again. And then uh, are there going to be vendors there also? Yes, there is vendors. Uh, we may have room for about three more vendors. The spots are probably all filled up at this point. But if you are a vendor and you would like to get a spot, they um, are very affordable. They're very reasonable. You can come on down and be a part of the Black Agenda as well and be a part of the Black market. So we do have a few spots left for that. So there are go to the website for that. Yes, you can do all of that on the website. Um, purchase tickets, give donations. You can fill out the form. You can also register online for the organizational training, which will be on Friday. So let me give them that again. That training is for all organizations. So we can talk about the um, unified national front, the national database, and what part the organizations play versus the individuals in the community. It's a twofold thing. And so that is Friday night. It's from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and that's at Sister's Place. It is a uh, 456 Nordstrom Ave, but that address is on the flyer. Um, that you can find. Also, that information is on the website. And then Saturday, the main event is at the Makata uh, Museum, and that is from 10 to 4, but the doors do open at 9. You can come on in and get your seat, and that is at 80 Hanson Place. Okay, excellent. And then uh, also, I have the uh, flyer uh, the flyer at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So for each city, you know, uh, the floor, we, we always put the information there on the homepage of the website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Two quick announcements, uh, and then we're going to get out of here. Um, uh, one, as many people know, uh, I am, well, I live in Detroit. 
the, the 37th annual African World Festival is going on this weekend at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. It's free and open to the public. Um, each year they get some like 100,000 people to come through. It's about 125 vendors. So uh, I will be uh, doing a presentation on Sunday, August 18th, 2019, 5.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. Then with Black Migrations, 1619 to 2019, uh, the Red Summer, 1919, the Birth of a Nation, and the Detroit Race Ride in 1943. So that's free and open to the public. Uh, it's in classroom 106 in the lower level of the museum. The information's at our website also. And uh, I'm also a vendor there as well. So uh, my booth is at the corner of, of uh, Brush and Warren, the corner of Brush and Warren, okay? So people come on out if you're in the Detroit area. Secondly, um, August 20th, 2019 is coming up. That is the 400th year anniversary of Jamestown, Virginia, August 20th, 1619. Even though that did happen, we do know African people have been here for tens of thousands of years, but I'm gonna announce to everybody for the first time, uh, I will be interviewing Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamenei on Tuesday, August 20th, 2019, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll do a Facebook Live broadcast. He called me a couple of nights ago and we're gonna break down this history uh, we'll deal with August 20th, why significant, but also the African presence before that and put all this stuff in perspective. So people look out for that. Follow us on the, the African History Network Facebook fan page um, and then also on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. Uh, 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 Michi, uh, give people the social media uh, handles as well. Okay, you can find, it's the Black Agenda on tour. That's on Instagram and on Facebook. You can find us in both places. The black agenda. Oh, black agenda. Now they can text. They can text something to get updates. Also, you can text the word "black agenda" to four eight four eight four eight. That's three forty eight. It's real easy to remember. And you just text the word "black agenda." It's all one word, "black agenda," and um, we will text you and keep you updated on in all things black agenda. Everything that has to do okay. with it. First to know if there's any specials, all the cities we're coming to, any changes or anything. It will just keep you updated through the text message. And, and very quickly, I, I, I talk about all these people like everybody know everybody knows who they are. Okay, Professor Cobb, Professor Cobb is one of my teachers, so I know that some people don't know. Him. He's in all the Hidden Colors documentaries, including Hidden Colors Five. He's in 1804. He's, uh, so he, dope. he's a brilliant, brilliant historian. One of my teachers as well, uh, formerly known as Booker T. Coleman. Okay, so I'm trying to set up some other interviews also uh, for uh, for Tuesday. Uh, uh, Jay, give people your uh, social media uh, uh, handles also. I am Jade Arendelle on Facebook and Lioness Crowned on Instagram. Also, how do you, how do you spell Crowned. Arendelle? How do, you, how do you spell Arendelle? Oh, yeah, that's A R R I N D E L L A R R I N D E L L. Okay. Uh, what did you say, Michi? I said in the bottom of her box, if they want to see it, that's how you spell her name. Yeah, yeah they got it there also. Yeah, for some people, you know, everybody's eyes ain't like they used to be now. <laughs> I just had my 30 year uh, high school reunion. Not the person that was, y'all can follow me everywhere, Michi X. M E H E E X. I'm on YouTube, I am on right. Facebook, and I'm on Instagram. Right. Okay. Well, look, uh, ladies, it's good talking to you all. I will Thank see you all uh, this coming weekend in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, everybody uh, follow uh, us on social media, follow the African History Network as well, and uh, uh, look out for the uh, interview with Professor Kaba Kamene. Uh, remember, right now, let's correct wrong behaviors. not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace. Peace. All right.